everyone, and thanks for joining us um, for this panel discussion on broadband and inclusion. I am McKenna Kelly, and I am a policy reporter at The Verge. I will be moderating today's conversation, and I am so excited to start introducing our panelists. Um, first, let's bring on Gigi Sohn, who is a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. Um, we also have Marcos Vilar, who is an executive director for um, Alianza for Progress. We have Onika Makwakwa, who is the head of Africa um, at the Alliance for Affordable Internet at the World Wide Web Foundation. Mm -hmm. Lucas Peterzak, the program manager for Next Century Cities. And Joshua Edmonds, the director of digital inclusion for the city of Detroit. I hope everyone's doing well today and I'm really excited to get into this conversation, um, especially at such an important time with yesterday's bipartisan infrastructure package finally you know, picking up some momentum. And I think I kind of want to start there. Um, I want to get everyone's, you know, initial take on this infrastructure package and how you see this fostering broadband expansion um, and inclusion um, across the country. Let's start with Gigi. Hi, everybody. Look, I think we need to know more of the details, <clears throat> but from what I'm hearing, uh, and I, I just got actually a text from a Hill staffer about five minutes ago, uh, both the provisions that relate to availability of broadband and the provisions that relate to affordability of broadband are pretty darn good. I mean, I, I think we have to remember this is a bipartisan package. This is Republicans and Democrats both saying that broadband is essential infrastructure uh, and it must be part of any infrastructure package. That being said, you know, not everything that I and, and my public interest colleagues would prefer to be in there is in there. But again, from the outline I've seen so far, very good. Uh, on both the accounts of broadband deployment slash availability and making broadband more affordable for low-income folks. Great, and let's move on to Marcos. I think you might be muted. I am, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm back. Um, well, I think it's definitely a, a step in the right direction. Um, I think that one of the big concerns for me is uh, underserved communities and, and, and specifically where I'm from in Orlando, um, it's the backyard of Disney. Uh, and, and here we have a problem, for example, with, with more than 10,000 homeless children in our public school system. And, you know, this, this is gonna, how do we make sure that this trickles down fast enough and effectively enough to make sure that those uh, kids um, and others that, that that have lack of access, you know, have access and are able to conduct, you know, their their homework and their and their day to day uh, with uh, broadband. Um, how about Joshua? How are you feeling about the broadband package? You know, uh, I, I feel all right. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily going to, um, you know, be overly enthusiastic about it, but I think that what it actually represents, if we take a, uh, a step back and contextually look at where we are, uh, you know, looking back even to uh, during the Obama era around the way that we were talking about broadband, uh, you know, obviously Connect Home was a thing that President Obama was pushing heavily, which was focusing on um, access to internet and public housing units. Now, the thing is, during that time, uh, we also had uh, BTOP, which were, you know, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program, where, yeah, there was money that was allocated from the government. And at the time, we thought that that was revolutionary funding. Um, but in comparison, it's a, it's a drop into what we have with this current infrastructure bill and what we've received from some of the ARPA funding already. Um, and obviously, through the Trump administration, uh, locally, we've been able to beef up our efforts. And we've seen local communities uh, do a great job through that, especially last year during the pandemic. And so I think that for, for, for us, we're optimistic to see nationally this um, increased slope as it relates to our conversation on, on, the t on the topic, especially looking at the intersection of, to your point, access and affordability. Uh, usually the affordability piece is what we've been kind of tasked with locally to figure out. And we've been robbing Peter to pay Paul for so long that I don't want to get seduced and being so happy because obviously there are certain things in it that we would like to see that aren't there. But at the end of the day, it's a step in the right direction and it's this president's administration's first year. So we'll see what uh, keeps coming for the next years. Right, and Lucas, um, what about the package for cities? Um, well, like Josh, you know, I'm optimistic and excited. And I think over the last 18 months, we have seen an increasing number of mayors and county executives who are prioritizing broadband topics. and 
the fact that, you know, we often at Next Century Cities have cities and communities that are just starting on, you know, what does this mean for us? And we have places like Detroit who are a part of our network that have amazing people like Josh at the helm. And the fact that across the spectrum, they're going to be able to address access and affordability because we know that the problems look very different in, you know, many communities, but we also see patterns across the country. And some cities and, you know, counties are really tackling, there is not the infrastructure here we need, but others say it's here, but people just can't get online. So excited to see the details start to roll out more and to be able to empower these mayors who have been dreaming big dreams and sort of just waiting for the ability to get it done. Right. Onika, any comments on, you know, what's happening on the Hill right now? Wow, great. It's actually great to see uh, this level of investment on broadband period, uh, you know, coming from lower income and middle income countries. Uh, the digital divide has been just so huge. But what's most important is really uh, getting our governments to understand that they need to invest in digital development uh, to be able to connect everyone. So I'm hoping we like to copy things that America does. So I'm hoping this is one of those things that will seriously take a look at and, and recognize that we need to prioritize uh, digital development uh, and investing in infrastructure to be able to bring everyone along. Right. And I, I kind of want to move into some more broader questions, um, thinking of just broadly, you know, what are the opportunities in broadband and digital inclusion and how when we sit down to make these bills, when we sit down to talk about this, you know, what sh how should we be thinking about um, broadband and digital co uh, inclusion holistically? Maybe we can ask Josh first. <laughs> Certainly. Um, okay, so I, oh man, I, I'm going to give an answer that's probably going to be uh, a, a bit realer. So oftentimes what I'm seeing, and I, I'm putting my money where my, my mouth is on this because I'll call out federal agencies such as the FCC. I called them out recently as relates to the emergency broadband benefit. Locally, it's been an incredibly difficult challenge to sign up residents uh, and to get them actually verified in the program. That being said, out of large metro cities, Detroit ranks third on sign up, so we're not doing a bad job. But again, I think that oftentimes what's missing is folks will say one plus one equals two. We all understand one plus one equals two. Uh, it makes sense for all of us. But what people are missing are all the little decimals in between one and two. And those decimals exist at the local level. And so as people are coming up with solutions that make sense to say, yeah, let's have a, and I, I don't want to keep picking on the emergency broadband benefit, but it makes sense. Um, let's have a benefit for all qualifying residents, uh, $50 a month off of their, their, their internet bill. Great. That makes sense. That, that framing makes sense to all of us. The problem is when you break it down locally, you see all the various challenges that it's going to take to get a resident to go from here to here. And imagine that every single time something is proposed, we all know it makes sense. But those little gaps in between keep getting missing. And then us locally put so much pressure on us to deliver. We want to have a permanent broadband subsidy. We want to you know, make our voice heard. But every single time we don't have it heard, we're essentially cut out of the equation. Then we're expected to make miracles happen off of these great initiatives at the onset that kind of get watered down as you go further down to the local level. Right. And how are you fighting that? What are you what are your team, you know, doing to make sure that people get the information they need um, about the EBB and other programs like that? Uh, well, I mean, we, we've actually created our own, uh, we have our own local commercial around the emergency broadband benefit. We stood up our own local call center. We've stood up our own community support network there. Um, out of our call center, we've been able to dispatch residents, pick up the phone. And the reason why we did that was because we saw the long wait times at the onset uh, when the program first rolled out. And we're like, no, 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 no one deserves to be on hold for that, especially for a critical resource. And so that was us stepping up and again, robbing Peter to pay Paul because there was no money put in there for community engagement. And so what we're trying to do our best is to galvanize stakeholders off of goodwill, which that's not sustainable. So that's why you kind of hear us saying again on the funding piece, we can do it, our, our best for local philanthropy and local fundraising, but at some point that level of nuance is going to need to penetrate that higher level. And if it does not happen, we're gonna be stuck robbing Peter to pay Paul in perpetuity. Right. Yeah, but, uh, if, if I could just sort of uh, come in here, I, I think it's really critical to see how much money is in this package for digital inclusion and digital equity efforts. So I think what we are now in our second or third Congress where we've been trying to get past the Digital Equity Act, uh, which will would do several things, including giving those folks on the ground like Josh, 
uh, the resources and the nonprofits in this space, the resources that they need to actually get people online. Right. So it's, you know, it, it's great to have the emergency broadband benefit. My understanding is there's a permanent benefit uh, in the in the package, in the broadband package. But if you don't, the missing piece, as, as Josh puts it, is, OK, you've got this you know great subsidy. Maybe you even have a cable company or a telephone company that's that's giving you know, low cost service. But if you can't find that person and I don't think the companies do a particularly good job of finding those people you can't find those, that person, you can't make sure that they have the skills to use uh, the internet. And, you know, we take it for granted. We, you know, we pop up on our computers, we get on the web, la, la, la. A lot of people don't know how to do that. It's not just a digital literacy problem. In some cases, it's a literacy literacy problem. Uh, there are trust issues, right? Is the government going to spy on me? Is AT&T going to spy on me? So those folks who are on the ground who can go door to door and say, do you have connectivity? And if you don't, here's how you get it. And what else can I do to make sure you can actually use it? We have to see whether this package includes portions of this Digital Equity Act, which would have provided money for you know that that sort of door-to-door -door local service. I agree entirely. This this is all about community engagement and getting the the, the word out there. And every city is different. Uh, some cities are very concentrated, and it's easier uh, to 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 get to people because you know they congregate. Now with COVID, you know we also have distancing and, and and people staying away from each other, not congregating in big numbers. But you have cities like Orlando that are very very spread out geographically, and if you don't have the ability to go door to door, knock on people and 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 on people's doors and and, and get the information out to them, it's 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 sort of you know a, a vicious circle, right? That that they they can't get. The information because they don't have the broadband access and they they don't know that they could have broadband broadband access if if they actually you know had it available. The last thing I'll say is uh, about ten years ago I visited Minneapolis and and I don't I don't travel the whole country all the time but I did have an opportunity to tra travel to Minneapolis and Minneapolis had broadband for everyone uh, everywhere. You you could go in the city you could you could connect to their um you know to their city's um internet uh, signal. And I, I think that this might be something interesting to look at also is how, how do we uh, provide, particularly in, in zip codes that are, uh, you know, uh, concentrated with, with, uh, with, with folks that are, you know, lower income, uh, maybe start in, in those sections providing uh, types of broadband, you know, uh, distribution that is free for the residents in those zip codes. Right. Onika, and in your line of work, um, how do we, you know, make, how do we have this conversation of infrastructure and, um, you know, empowerment holistically? Oh, it looks like she might have um, had some internet problems. So honestly, let's go to Lucas. Lucas, uh, if you want to like get in on this conversation. Uh, yeah, I, I think the point that everyone has made so far is something that we try to really drill home. And it's that, and I think Josh sort of hit on this as well. It's, this looks different everywhere. And, you know, in my dream world, every city would have a Josh at the helm who is passionate about this and is on the ground making it happen. But I think something we realize with our cities is not every community, you know, regardless of their size, is able to have a broadband team or a digital inclusion team that some of these places, you know, they have part time mayors or part time city councils and they're working with a city government of four employees who run everything. And I think we have to remember that those people deserve a seat at the table, a real seat at the table, as much as the big cities do. And sort of going beyond this ceremonial, um, coming to these cities and saying, hi, these are our policy proposals, do you sign off on them? And instead walking way back to, I know something someone said in the last panel, even back to the questions and saying, you know, what do we need to be asking? You know, what, we don't wanna to come to you with proposals just for you to give us your stamp of approval and someone can come forward and say, look, 20 mayors agreed with us. Instead come forward and say, 20, 50, 100 mayors said these are the issues they're facing. So mm -hmm. let's develop, you know, policy solutions around that, not around what we want that we think mayors and communities will like. Right. And we're talking about the EBB. And of course, the EBB, um, we have it because of the pandemic mostly. And, you know, the light and the uh, the light that that's shown on digital inequity in the country and people not having access to the Internet at a time when 
we're doing this panel virtually right now, right? Um, we're doing um, work virtually, we're going to school virtually, and um, using COVID as ground zero, how do we ground innovation in these realities and actually solve the problems that we have um, here? I don't know if maybe we want to go to Gigi first on that. Sure. Look, and, and, and this is something that Josh and Lucas probably know and, and Marcos as well. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories about how cities and states had to scrape by during uh, the pandemic in order to get school kids online, in order to get poor people online. You know, unfortunately, the FCC has not collected any data on this, uh, and they've not collected any data on how well or how not so well uh, the low-cost programs that the that the broadband providers offered, uh, how they worked. Did they actually move the needle in getting people online? Are people still online? So there's a lot we really don't know, and a lot of data collection uh, that still, in my opinion, needs to be done. But you know. Talk about ground zero, the cities in particular, I mean, they have stories among stories among stories about how they had to scrape together philanthropic money, you know, beg providers, uh, you know, do whatever needed to be done uh, to get folks online. And I think that's, you know, that's where you got to start. You have to start with the folks who are actually on the ground mm -hmm. and who have the stories about the kids sitting in front of the Taco Bell and, uh, you know, uh, and and other folks, you know, sitting in the library parking lot uh, to in order to get connectivity or the Wi-Fi on school buses. So that's that's where I would go. We have the folks on the ground. One of the things that I do actually like a lot about the, the broadband package, as far as I know, is that the money, $40 billion, will go to states, which will trickle down. To, to, to localities for sure. And I think actually the states and the cities are they're much better suited than even the federal government to know where the holes are uh, and, how, and how they should be filled. So I actually think uh, not all my public interest colleagues agree with me, but I'm actually very high on the, the states and particularly on the, on the cities and towns in figuring out what their needs are and filling it with the resources that the federal government's giving them. Right. Marcos, you're talking about Orlando. And we're talking about COVID right now. And with coronavirus cases spiking, how are we thinking, you know, in Orlando and in Florida about digital inclusion after the pandemic? Yeah, it's it's um it's, it's the, it continues to be a challenge. Um, I don't think that that uh, anybody would argue against that. Um, I know that for uh, looking I've been involved in public education for a long time. I was a teacher in, in Chicago in my early earlier years. Now here in Orlando, we're closely with the with the um, Orange County uh, school district, and uh, we've we we're hearing. Uh, I, I don't think there are any numbers that have been re re published yet. But we're hearing that about fifteen percent or more uh, students were completely uh, disconnected, lost contact with the school system during the um, the period of time that that students were were uh, studying virtually, uh, where the schools were closed. And so that's that's a huge hole. That's a huge gap. And uh, these are these are some of the concerns that that, that we're looking at and, and and thinking. And and how 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 much of that you know it, it, it is a question of not having access, not having access to to broadband that that they weren't in fact able to connect. So uh, the schools are opening again, but then now we have we have uh, this Delta variant that is you know threatening us again. And 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 uh, you know who, who knows what's going to happen next in, in that sense. But uh, but I, I, I do think that it's, it's a huge challenge, and, and thankfully these funds are headed, headed our way, uh, and, and, and we can figure out ways to, to you know, improve where we failed before. Right, and I just want to welcome Onika back. Um, we had a little bit of an issue with some Wi-Fi there, but I'm glad you're back um, to join us for the rest of this conversation. And um, we're talking about coronavirus and inclusion um, and making sure people are connected and how we... Um, how we move forward in light of the pandemic. I don't know if there's anything you could touch on there too. Great, thanks. But I, I, I guess the first thing would be to say also making sure we have stable electricity, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, what happened uh, just a few minutes ago. So I had to switch to an alternative source quickly. But um, yes, absolutely. I think what has happened with the pandemic is that it has really shown us uh, our existing disparities, especially in terms of digital inclusion, uh, the divide uh, in terms of gender, as well as in terms of rural v. urban, and really emphasized why we need to invest in digital development 
not just infrastructure, but um, I believe Gigi mentioned earlier the issue of digital skills, making sure that everyone has uh, the requisite digital skills to be able to take advantage of these digital dividends, but also making sure that we've got access to affordable devices and that as we open up these funds like the Universal Service Access Funds uh, in the US, I believe that's through FCC, that we make sure that they are not strictly restricted to investing on infrastructure Structure, but can also be utilized for investing on digital skills as well as on affordable devices because the infrastructure alone uh, is not going to enable full participation of all citizens uh, in uh, the digital space. Great. Um, and now, I mean, something that we keep talking about, we keep coming back to in this conversation is engaging with the communities on the ground, you know, Josh, and Lucas too, let's start with Josh, but what do you want the federal government doing? What do you want them talking to you about, communicating with you about in order, you know, to, to use this money, you know, in the most effective way in order to reach these communities and really, you know, have an impact on, you know, cities like Detroit and other places? You know, I think the, the, the federal government has been doing a pretty decent job of being responsive. Uh, and I, I know I'm not necessarily one that's gonna put everything on them um, whenever things don't go right. I'll be honest, we still have restrictive laws within the state of Michigan around municipal broadband uh, and around community ownership where we as a municipality would like to support much more uh, and, and have a much more front facing approach to Internet providers, um, especially bringing new ones into our ecosystem. And so as the federal government is allocating a lot of this funding, um, you know, I think that in Detroit, I'm not necessarily as optimistic about how we're going to be empowered from an infrastructure standpoint, strictly because of our state laws that are gonna be prohibiting that. And I think that's another topic of conversation there. But I think uh, from the federal standpoint, and Gigi touched on this, uh, data. I, we need much more longitudinal data as it relates to this digital divide. I think we're gonna shoot ourselves in the foot if we do not put data at the forefront. As I'm looking at even, you know, we received about $45 million for ARPA funding specifically carved out for digital inclusion. A lot of your other communities across the city have maybe received five to 10 and some haven't received anything. And so I know that in Detroit, you know, we're gonna be building out a, a, a data ecosystem, a data repository that's gonna allow us to be able to say, hey, long-term, these are what these interventions look like. These are the policy levers we can pull off of this data. What I would like to see happen is that as the federal government is standing up these interventions, there is a real, real focus on the data part of this equation. I don't think that about that enough and i think that that data piece i don't want to be limiting anything that someone's going to say is like what about this related to that i'm going to say yes and to all of it because i don't think there's ever going to be a shortage of data that we need because we've gone so long without it right and onika in your line of work you know how are you building um relationships with communities you know to really find out what these issues are on the ground and how to solve these problems we have found that uh, we, we have to take an attitude of it takes everyone and that it's not just government, it's not just private sector, uh, it's private sector, it's government, it's civil society as well. Uh, it's really important to build with civil society um, engaged, especially uh, in, in including at the policy level, so that we can avoid uh, pitfalls like building digital centers uh, in areas where women don't feel safe to walk to, uh, in areas that uh, people generally don't congregate. So it's really, uh, you know, uh, been a, a strategy for, for us uh, to create coalitions that are multi-stakeholder, bringing them together to really inform the policy process and, and tell us what is that they want uh, a lot of uh one thing that i hear a lot here in the region in, in africa in general is nothing for us without us uh, meaning that communities want to be an integral part of not just the implementation but the planning uh, process, uh, as well as in the policy conversations, which we tend to leave social, civil society out of. They want to be part of th those plans uh, so that, uh, you know, they can inform them and they can, we, we know when they're involved that they will actually utilize it. And it's also just 
good uh, practice uh, to consult and, and engage uh, civil society and all other sectors as well. Uh, in, in particular, also when you look at the amount of money that's needed for infrastructure in Africa in general, uh, to be able to connect the unconnected at the moment, uh, it's going to take more than just government. It's going to take private sector investment. So we have the responsibility to create that enabling environment for private sector to be able to invest in digital development. Uh, it's going to take uh, multilateral donors, it's going to take government, yes, but uh, we, we need to you know, be engaging across the board. Right. And Lucas, I mean, what are you hearing from cities? You know, what do they want? You know, how, are, how do they want to be communicated with, you know, to get these problems solved? Yeah, and I think Josh and Onikam both made a phenomenal point. And going back to the very first thing that Josh had mentioned is removing the policy and statutory barriers that are standing in the way of local solutions. It's something that, you know, Next Century Cities has weighed in on in Ohio recently and last year in Idaho and other states across the country. It's, you know, we have these local leaders who want the funding and want the freedom to pursue these solutions that could help close the divide for them and digitally include as many residents as possible. But oftentimes there are barriers in the way that like Josh mentioned that don't let them do what they know they can do and be successful at. And I think that's what we've pushed for is the local solutions are going to ultimately be that last piece that fully bridges the divide. But every day that passes that, you know, a barrier stands in the way of Detroit doing something or a community in Arizona, that's a day wasted that those local officials can't take the necessary steps to do what Annika said and include their communities in the planning to be able to figure out, you know, if the best solution is A, but we have to go with B because someone is standing in our way. Well, now we're spending money on something that may do a decent job, but in turn had to sacrifice, you know, what could have been a phenomenal solution. So I think, like I mentioned earlier, bringing those local leaders into federal conversations, into state conversations, including tribal leaders or urban native leaders in the conversations, bringing them to the table and really asking them, you know, what tools have we not given you yet? And what things are continuing to stand in your way? Because until we figure out, you know, what exactly are local communities and municipal leaders, what barriers are they having to tackle on their own? We're not going to get the solutions and the results we're looking for. And I think, you know, specifically to reemphasize Josh's point, there is never too much data in the world. And we have seen more and more communities undertake it on their own and sort of find their own money for research proposals or you know, for feasibility studies, because it is lacking at the federal level and states have stepped up too, but it's really coming down to people standing in their grocery store, their community center and handing out paper surveys that say, you know, what is your service condition? You know, are you getting speeds that you're paying for? Are you getting good customer service? So looking at those solutions and realizing, you know, it's going to come down to these hyper-local solutions and sort of this ground game if we want to accomplish what we're looking for. Right. Something I think Josh and Lucas, you both mentioned was um, these barriers, right? And I think something that was in the original infrastructure plan from President Biden was, you know, prioritizing municipal, um, publicly owned internet access and things like that. And um, in yesterday's press release from the White House, that language was missing. And I am curious uh, how you feel about, you know, not having this kind of preemption language for these bills, um, for these, you know, preempting all of these state laws that make it more difficult for um, states to work, you know, with different like munis and things like that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's two things. It's not just the preemption, right? Mm -hmm. Which is disappointing to not see, but you can't really be surprised in a bipartisan mm -hmm. bill that it wouldn't be in there. But the second part was <clears throat> actually preferencing for funding those it, it, municipal projects in those states in which it is allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's really a two part thing that's missing because it would have been really nice. You know, one of the barriers uh, to municipal builds, even in those places, those states where it is allowed, is the price tag. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the and the, sometimes the lack of you know uh, availability of capital, particularly in the first year or two, where you really need that capital. So, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, Chris Mitchell is a great guy with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and he's always complaining to me about why aren't more cities building municipal systems even where they can? And the problem is you see the numbers and you're like, oh, my God, there's no way we can afford this. So having that preference for those that could build 
would have been really, really important. And it's I'm not surprised, given how um, Republicans feel about uh, municipal community broadband builds uh, to begin with. I'm not surprised it's not there, but it's it is a disappointment. And I'd obviously love to see those restrictions lifted and to see that preference restored. And I, honestly, I, I think that it, it, it is disappointing because uh, I don't look at municipal broadband as the silver bullet. A lot of people do that. They over index on the value of it. it. It is valuable. But at the end of the day, I'm looking at that from a standpoint of even if I know that in Michigan, we have these restrictive laws uh, in place to prohibit this happening. In other states, a win for a, a city anywhere is a win for all of us. And so that's where, like, if I can illuminate a lesson that's learned, I then can use that to say, hey, why aren't we doing that here? Hey, state, if we did this. And so, like, I'm looking at it from that standpoint where it's disappointing. But at the same time, I'll also say, and I know that the municipal broadband folks are going to get mad when I say this, but at the end of the day, if people cannot afford Internet access, and even from a water standpoint, if that is something that people can't afford that, we have to get a, at the root of the digital divide here. And at the root of it is, it's not going to be bridged by a municipal network being built. It is going to be addressed by a municipal network being built. And so all we local leaders want to do is be able to say, give us more options, empower our residents with options. There's a certain digital poverty in this country that no one seems to want to really articulate what it is. If we are living in most cities and having a duopoly, and it's either AT&T, Comcast, Spectrum or whatever, I have to work with these people. I don't hate it, actually. They're actually pretty cool on the ground to work with. But at the end of the day, our residents need options. And if there is something that's prohibiting our residents from getting those options, then that in itself is uh, fostering a, a further state of digital inequity that we can't get around. Right, right. I actually, think there's, oh, go yeah, ahead. If I, could, if I could just share a story actually to, to support this. Uh, in South Africa, a few years ago, we had a city where the mayor wanted to be known as the mayor who got uh, internet uh, to the city for the most part. And he used his budget uh, to uh, provide public Wi-Fi. Uh, and this is the city of Tswana, which is the capital city, by the way. And uh, one of the stories from that experiment, unfortunately, we don't, no longer have Swane Wi-Fi anymore, uh, you know. But one of the, the stories that really stayed with me from this was this young boy who is, was about eight years old at the time and used to be in trouble with his mother all the time because he would walk about three kilometers daily to get to a point where he can tap into the municipality's Wi-Fi. And when this boy was interviewed and asked, you know, why is it so important for you to uh, go this far and to always be getting in trouble to be online? And his response was simply that, you know, he lives in a shack and when he's online, he no longer lives in a shack. He's got access to more than just his surrounding. And it was just so powerful, you know, just to demonstrate how uh, something as simple as, as giving public access to someone who otherwise would not be able to afford it can have a potential of helping them transform their lives and, and ultimately address some of the many other competing social economic issues that cities try to attend to. Right. Great. And then uh, I just want to, you know, put pitch one last question before we start going into the Q&A from everyone. We're here, we're having this conversation, but what are we not talking about? You know, if you had to have, you know, a conversation with one of these policymakers, one of these leaders, and there was like one thing you had to let them know, you know, what are we not talking about? I'm seeing Josh's face. He looks like he wants to say something. It, I, I it's my uh, yeah I smile too much um all right I guess not um so the, the the thing that I and I know that you know next century cities national league of cities like a, a number of folks are doing this to an extent but I think that the conversation needs to be had in the same way that locally here we're doing our best to organize our community for specific objectives and outcomes. There needs to be something with this much money on the table and this much money coming in, we can't repeat the B-top failures where people who are spending money in a way that had Republicans scared for a decade. And so this is something where as we're moving forward, the conversation really should be had on standardization, reporting and data collection. And that sounds so dry. I know it does, but that is so effective. 
And I have a real fear that there are going to be certain communities that are going to be spending money on things with unvetted advice because they're going to be listening to their vendors and spending money on things that aren't really going to help us move the needle collectively. So I, I, I really want to say that this is a great moment in time, but we can't lose sight of the future here and we can't be wasteful the way that we're thinking about this. And we need to do this in a collaborative and a coalition minded way where we each are taping one step forward at the same time, I get communities are different, but at the end of the day, the way we bridge the digital divide is going to be very similar for most of us. And I think that we need to be much more lockstep than we where we are right now. Right, Marcos, what are we talking about? Can you can you hear me? Yes. And, and can you see me? Because I lost my screen. And, I, and oh I, no, you're yeah. all good. Okay, great. <laughs> well, I I I, I want to go back to the complication of government and how the different levels work together and so often work against each other. And, um, and, and in the case of Florida specifically, uh, we were talking earlier about preemption, how they've pre preempted and taken away local control from, from a lot of what, what can happen in a city or, or in a county uh, here in Florida. And, and it seems like at every turn also, monies that are directed from the federal government for a particular purpose or even generated through uh, revenue uh, matters like the Sadowski Fund for for, for uh, affordable housing here in, in Florida, they're tapped and redirected for purposes which they were not set up for. Uh, that is happening in Florida. It's probably happening in, in in other states as well. And that's that's something that for me for us is very very concerning. And if there's a way for us to be able to sidetrack or 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 basically put money directly into nonprofits or you know other other forms so that that so that they can get the work done in the cities the way it's necessary, then, then that, that might be a way to, to, to look at how we can tap some of those federal funds directly by the cities or the counties or directly by, by even um, working together in partnership with nonprofits. Right, right. Now, um, I wanna make sure we have time to get to all these audience questions. Um, I have one from Jennifer Cooper here asking, um, is mesh a way around state restrictions on municipal broadband? I don't know, anybody, Gigi maybe, somebody can answer this, mesh networks. You know, I, th I think they're okay in the short term, but look, everybody needs a connection to their home, okay? A high speed, scalable, uh, affordable connection to their home and you know, mesh networks are, you know, good if you need a, you know, a, a quick connection, but they're not always the strongest. Um, I don't, I don't think that's ultimately the answer. I think it's a short term answer, but not a long term answer. Mm -hmm. And if I can get back to the municipal, I agree with Josh. It's not the be all end all for everything, but I think we'd all agree on this panel that communities should at least have a choice. And that's what's so maddening about the state laws that prohibit communities from having a choice. Because in a lot of the areas where they'd like to build, the incumbents are not interested in building. So you just have deserts. I mean, when I was at the FCC, we tried to preempt the laws of the state of Tennessee and North Carolina that were pro prohibiting new builds and also expansions of builds that had already happened. And the stories about people who had to cobble together DSL and satellite for $300 a month it, they beg the cable companies, come serve us, you know, and the and and the, the telecoms come and serve us, and they're like, it's not worth it. It's too expensive. So that's what I find the most maddening about these limitations is it doesn't allow for expansion to areas that the incumbents would never serve in a million years. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, I wanna ask one last question here before we start to wrap up. It seems like there's some folks in the comments here who are thinking about just as, um, I think several people on the panel have, the broadband infrastructure is great and we're talking about it and we're finally starting to do something about it. Um, but what about devices and making sure people even have you know money to get these devices to participate in 21st century economy? Um, is there anything? Are we hearing anything about the bipartisan infrastructure package having anything to help with devices? Or you know how could the FCC or other you know organizations help people you know get the devices they need in order to even participate in um, the 21st century economy? I'll just pose that to everyone. That's from um, Andy, Andy Stutzman. Asked that. I one. hear it's not in there. I hear it's not in the mm -hmm. current package. And some folks like my old organization, Public Knowledge, are pushing back. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to say something provocative. I don't understand why in this country where we have device manufacturers like Apple and Microsoft 
and Dell and others who have more and Google have more money than God, why we even have to rely on the federal government for devices. I'm, you know, maybe I'm just like completely out there, but it just seems to me that those companies could easily afford to make sure that every person who cannot afford a device can get a device. Right. Yeah. What, what, how do we, how do we get these devices into people's hands? I really am curious and I want to press on this. Is there anything, you know, um, else we could do to make sure, is there anything local communities can do anything that you've seen on the ground that helps, you know, get these devices in people's hands? Well, I, I think um, there, there's uh, there's secondhand devices. Also, there's a lot of uh, you know consumerism around devices in the you know among people and and setting up ways to re refurbish and and reprovide or re redistribute uh, used um, uh, devices. I think is a great idea, and I don't see that happening anywhere. Right. Yeah. Locally, we definitely set up a, a refurbisher model and, and network. Um, and, you know, it, it, it works from a sustainability standpoint because you're tapping into existing business processes. So, you know, it's great to see there. But uh, I think this reads more like robbing Peter to pay Paul more, which local communities, we've been doing this. So this is no surprise or shock to us. Uh, this is us looking at federal grants and then repurposing them, saying that they're telehealth to get telehealth enabled devices to people. Um, and I, I hate to be that candid, but that's exactly how we have to do it. Um, and to, to Gigi's point, yeah, I agree. Like at some point, we, we have to stop running to the federal government here. While yes, they've been absent for a lot of this stuff, especially in the urban context. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, I do recognize that, look, this is a one-time cost here. These devices literally are one-time cost. The refurbisher model that we have set up, they can do the tech support piece. So that's already sustainable for us. It's just something where on the device um, uh, side of the house, we're going to have to keep robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're going to have to keep philanthropically funding this. Thankfully, philanthropy actually does fund devices more. Internet's hard for them to fund because of that perpetual cost. Hey, $150 for a device? Sure, we'll, we'll do that. $250? And I think that through the emergency connectivity fund, through the FCC, you're getting people connected through the schools and the libraries. It's, it's not enough. But I also agree with Gigi here, and I can't believe I'm saying this, and this is being recorded, but I don't believe that onus actually rests in totality on the federal government. I think that we need to actually be demanding the same level, if not more, from our private companies in this country. Mm -hmm. Onika, you touched on this as well um, previously in another question. I, how do we, how do we you know, get these devices in people's hands? Yes, certainly. I mean, that's a huge issue for especially the lower income uh, countries, right? Um, in Africa, for example, a, a low cost entry level smartphone costs uh, similar to a small household appliance like a microwave. Uh, so if you know a family is to make uh, choices, they're more less likely to select buying a device for each individual. Yet we tend to be a mobile first and, and sometimes mobile only uh, continent. Uh, so certainly secondhand uh, refurbished devices have uh, come in very helpful. But for us, we've got different priorities. One of them being, you know, pushing for local assembly, uh, which is, is not happening sufficiently in, in uh, the global south in general, but uh, also, uh, you know, import duty uh, that is placed on these devices in some countries can go up as high as 20 to 30 percent. So rolling back the, the import duty with the understanding that this is a basic uh, need uh, for, for your community. Uh, one of the things that I know South Africa is also uh, talking about is being able to consider uh, an entry-level smartphone as one of the basic uh, household goods. Uh, you know, there's kind of like a, a basket of uh, basic household goods like milli meal, uh, soap, and, and those kinds of things. So uh, recalculating that to include uh, an entry-level uh, smartphone uh, and uh, to see where that lands us so that then we are really realistic about affordability because device affordability is actually what has kept 75,000 children out of school uh, during this past year in South Africa because they just simply could not connect from home uh, because of the internet but also largely because of a lack of devices. Right. And I think that brings us to time. Onika, everyone, thank you so much. Um, this has been such a great discussion. And I'm so glad, you know, we could all be here to talk about, you know, such an important issue. And um, that's going to close out this panel. Uh, and I want to bring it back to Lillian to really close us out here. 
Thanks, McKenna. What an amazing panel. Um, I'm going to pick on one quote um, that I think just exemplifies this whole morning. Nothing for us without us. Um, nothing says informed and engaged like that. Um, and then I also just wanted to thread a couple of things that I think both panels have really touched on. One, the importance of this local state federal government collaboration. It just seems like if we're not connecting all of those um, policies across the three layers, um, we're going to be missing out on some innovation opportunities. Opportunities. And then lastly, the power of data, not just on the accessibility front in terms of what the public can do with more data at their hands, but also really data to help us understand what inequity looks like and how it manifests in our daily lives. So with that, um, here's some instructions on the rest of the day. We're going to take a 15 minute break and at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to transition back. Um, for those of you that are night grantees, if you are registered as a grantee, you'll click on the sessions icon on the left side of your screen, and you will find both a communications training and a grants administration training. You're welcome to either and or to toggle back and forth. These will be led by my colleagues, Roshni Neslej and Vicky Checo, um, and there will be great trainings just on how to navigate working with night um, and continue to um, you know, partner with us in, in building uh, more innovative communities. Then at 3.15 p.m. Eastern, we're going to click back on the stage icon on the left side of your browser and join the stage um, again for a panel on equitable recovery for public spaces and city planning. And then lastly, at 4 p.m. Eastern, I hope you stay because we will be able to peruse our expo hall. And that's where you'll actually get to meet and greet a lot of the night grantees across the network. Um, not everyone, but a lot of the night grantees across the network. Um, I would be uh, remiss to not mention, you know, in our broadband work, not only do we prior with, we partner with cities like Detroit, but North Carolina, Charlotte is doing amazing work around digital inclusion as well. So there's a lot of grantees um, on, on this um, network and the show um, today. And so I hope that you're able to stay through the day to really check that out. So with that, um, take a break and then we'll see you shortly. Thank you.